Okay, well, it turns out uh, that the voice in my ear, the voices in my head, mean that the show is indeed live. It is another eSports heaven. I'm Richard Lewis, the editor-in-chief of Cadre.org, Tech9, eSports reprobate and host of this show. And uh, my co-host is, of course, James Duffield from Streamgasm, a lovely chap. He's the good-looking one of the partnership. How are you getting on, James? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I'm good. Playing, streaming some games, streaming some Call of Duties. I'm sorry to interrupt you, having so much fun. Here we are in E3 week, dream hack around the corner, and you're just, you know, treating this like just some kind of secondary concern. It's 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 nice. I would, um, I am very excited for dream hack. I wish I was going. I wish well, I could be there in the midst of it. We're going to talk but, about that in a bit, because I do want to pick your brains about your dream hack memories, but that's kind of tipped the gaff. Tonight's show is going to be a show that's basically all about dream hack. We, we lovingly called it the show dreams are made of, and uh, whoever come up with that is fired fucking immediately. Uh, okay, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we've got some great guests to reflect our love of DreamHack. I haven't gone to DreamHack for a long time. I do think it's a fantastic event. It is going to be a heavily fired show. And uh, you'll be able to hear uh, our guest as he appears. It is Thomas Graycon Hermanson, who is the eSports manager uh, for DreamHack, the head of eSports, I should say, rather. That is his official title. Thomas, how are you getting on there? It's busy. It's very, very busy, actually. It's been uh, two hectic days already. We're, we're actually at the event venue, starting to build the stages and the tournament areas and setting every, everything up. Uh, so it's been really busy, actually. I, well, I have, a, have a coffee and uh, have you guys here. So well, it, we're here to keep you company in what is probably your first break in about two days. But uh, let, let's, let's start a little bit about, about yourself and, and your role as head of uh, eSports at DreamHack. <clears throat> In fact, no, before we do that, uh -huh, yeah, well remembered, uh -huh. I've got to plug the hashtag. I always fuck this up on the show. I'm a terrible host. Uh, we, we are going to be running the question of the day, and the question of the day is DreamHack the best eSports event? Uh, we want your thoughts about that. Maybe you've got a DreamHack anecdote, an experience, maybe a riddle, a limerick, whatever. Something about DreamHack which James will be plowing through at uh, at some point and use the hashtag on Twitter hashtag esports heaven or one word. So Thomas, I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I'm I'm asking you to do an introduction and then I interrupt that introduction. So let's talk about yourself and how you got to be uh, the the head of esports at DreamHack because that's quite a lofty fucking title. I, I'd be I'd love that gig, man. That'd be sweet. Yeah, uh, well, I, I've been into esports since maybe 2003, something something like that. Started as a Counter Strike player. Mm -hmm. Became a team captain for that team, st got sponsored by a gaming center uh, called Kaboom at that time. We played in the Swedish Esport League, which, which was uh, one of the biggest Counter-Strike leagues at that time in Europe uh, because it had SK and Adrenaline and Team 9 and all those teams in it. Um, we, we played there um, and I met a friend called Ponda, uh, which was the founder of that internet cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, called Kaboom, and uh, we started a lot of different projects within esports. Um, I've been in managing teams, I've been running websites, magazines, I've been working for a couple of different companies along the way. And uh, I think 2006 we started Rakaka, which was at that time something new in esports, the first tabloid, in my opinion, when it comes to esports. Now it's pretty much a dead website, but that's led me into DreamHack and the world of DreamHack because we suddenly we were coverage partners, we did casting, we did all that and uh, both me and Ponda started to work for DreamHack instead because that's mm. basically the only company in Sweden where you can work full time with esports so right. that, that's how I ended up at DreamHack basically. Um, so, when, so when did you become the, the head of esports? I mean how did you kind of progress into that role because you know I'm, I'm familiar, it's funny I was talking to Hellspawn about the history of, you know, Rakaka and their involvement, the staff. Um, as he put it, DreamHack killed Rakaka because they took all of the staff and now you all, all work for them. But um, how did you get to be the, the, the head of esports? I mean, was there any progression involved? Did you, did you get that job right from the start? Uh, almost. Uh, but, but the thing was that DreamHack is not an esport company from the beginning. We, we, we changed ownership, I think, 2007 something, when Robert uh, joined and also a couple of other owners. And that's where the strategy or 
the eSport focus started and uh, I was part of that progress. So I, I was pitching a lot of ideas, I was very involved in all the tournaments, all the productions and all that. So I think suddenly I, I was just head of eSports. So it, I, I don't know really when I got the title really. I, I've been involved with so much. I mean, everyone at Dreamhack have like four or five jobs. So I'm, yeah. I'm not only working with eSports, I'm working with a lot of other crazy stuff as well. So what kind of uh, decisions have you been involved with then in, in the progression of Dreamhack? I mean, if you're doing so much, what would you say is, is a, a, an accurate description of your day-to-day, -day, the kind of decisions you have to make as head of eSports? I think it's uh, obviously the tournaments, but I'm not very involved in the details of the tournaments but mm -hmm. setting up which games maybe recruiting the head admins recruiting the, the key people around it mm -hmm. uh, i'm talking to all the publishers i'm talking to all the sponsors um, i'm not the sales guy but i'm basically deciding what the sponsor can buy from us and, and mm. what we can offer um, i'm also pretty much in charge of the everything related to the broadcasting as well. Uh, I, I'm not saying the technical part of the broadcasting, but actually talking to the broadcast companies about broadcasting esports. Um, so in short, it's broadcast, tournaments, sponsors. So it's, it's a lot of different stuff, actually. Well, what about decisions? This is, this is kind of where I'm going with this, because obviously there's been a lot of uh, new kind of games coming to DreamHack. We've seen a lot of changes. We've seen the uh, you know kind of demise, if you like, of 1.6, and DreamHack was one of the first big events to say, you know what, we're going to pick up CS:GO, and CS:GO was at uh, the DreamHack Valencia part of the tour. Um, we're seeing World of Tanks at, uh, at at DreamHack. How how much uh, of the decision making process uh, you know are you involved in when it comes to what games that we pick up and we, we see at DreamHack events? Uh... We're basically three people. It's me, Hellspawn, and Ponda that I talked about earlier that I started Record Call. So we're three people, basically, together deciding all the games. But it's so many different factors or different things that can, um, I mean, turn that decision into a certain yeah. <laughs> direction. I mean, it's obviously the sponsors, what kind of sponsor you can get. It's uh, the publishers, how easy it is to cooperate or work together with them. Um, it's What's the community in Sweden? I mean, we, we don't support games generally uh, with, with no players at all in Sweden because our roots are, are here and we have 15,000 gamers in the halls of DreamHack. So we can't really pick a game, let's say an uh, Asian game or a game that don't have a core community here in Sweden. Yeah. And uh, you basically try to navigate the, 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 the community website, see what, what kind of games are, are getting traffic, getting personalities around it, getting famous casters, yada yada. So it's a lot of different factors. But in the end, I think it's, it's my decision because it's usually, for us now, it's a, it's a budget uh, thing. I mean, we need to at least cover the price money, the production, and a couple of other stuff just to do a tournament. We can't just do it because we think it's fun. Okay. <laughs> and well, well let, let's talk about that process then. <clears throat> how, how, do, how does DreamHack function? Because obviously you can see there's, there's a bit more kind of transparency. It's a lot easier to understand, say, for example, how, you know, Intel Extreme Masters works. You know, you've got, you've got uh, a very big title sponsor. They stump up the prize money. Um, you know, their name splashed all over the tournaments and whatnot. And, you know, th they, they're paying out the prizes. And the ESL, the Intel Extreme Masters staff, that's the infrastructure. They run the tournament. That's how it works. DreamHack obviously draws money from several sources. Uh, the tournaments as well seem to be uh, very independent in, in terms of, uh, for example, you know, you, you have Dota 2, you have League of Legends side by side uh, with, with, without any issue, uh, it seems, whereas other people seem to be bound by exclusivity. So how, how is it? You, what, what's a typical process? How do you get the prize money in place? What dictates what games you're going to run and, and how do you move it forward once you've made a decision about what you're going to have? Um, it's, a, it's a kind of difficult process in the end. I, and it's also, I mean, 
we didn't start all these different games at the same time. So obviously, mm. starting off with Counter Strike, for example, it's been one of our core games since the beginning. In the beginning, it was just like a really, really small tournament in the LAN uh, or in the bring your own computer area. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we started to grow that with with the sponsors in the actual event. So we started to talk to the companies we had in the event and trying to get them to invest into Counter Strike so we could have a bigger price purse, bigger build a bigger arena for it, so we could mm. have more spectators and stuff like that. So that was the organic process, so to speak. The the the, the other big, uh, a lot of other games. It's it's more. Of, uh, I think we're looking at the ca categories or the different genres you have and we try to pick one game for each genre. Mm. Uh, so like in fighting games we have all, always been supporting Street Fighter at, la at least the last three, four years I think. Uh, in uh, MOBA it was from the beginning Dota, Dota 1 um, um, and after that that, that genre or that uh, segment you, like just like blow blew everyone's mind so I, I mean we, we had to go for both home at that time um, uh, and after that League of Legends and now also Dota 2 so we can't really just have one game per because it's so big it's so many players it's so many many viewers and so many fans at Remax so it's I mean it, it's very different from game to game you can't really have one uh, fixed uh, process or something mm. for that. Uh, I think we're very different to a lot of other organizers because uh, I mean we we also want to we really want to like the games that we're working with. We don't do tournaments that in games that we don't really like ourselves or ha at least have admins or people in our crew that really love to 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 host or take care of that specific game. So mm. Um, well, what about in terms of drumming up? I mean, like, well, and, and yeah, just think, some people have noticed there is some bang going on. He's at his yeah. office is right in the heart of DreamHack, so the event is being built up around him. You will get some background noise. Here you go. You can see we're going to get a little look around. This is what they put, this is what they put aside. So, I got to mute my microphone when I'm. Yeah, no worries. So, so I, I apologize if we do get some hammering, but uh, he was good enough to. Come on while I'm in the thick of it. So we apologise for any background noise, but hopefully you'll uh, you'll understand, and uh, we'll get that guy with the hammer uh, as soon as we can. I'll certainly get him when I'm out there in a couple of days. But what I was going to ask you, Thomas, was um, in regards to say justification. Uh, this is one of the things that everybody in esports has to deal with: the justification. So um, it can be, say, for my company when we run a tournament, we go to a client and we say, you know, we got five thousand people sign up for it. Uh, we generate this many uh you know page impressions uh the traffic was this much uh you had this global reach you got retweeted by these people and that's pretty much what we put together in a report um i don't know if it's the same for dreamhack but when you're uh running a tournament what are you guys looking for uh in terms of judging its success so next time around you can have that tournament again in one word hype i mean okay. the the general hype around it it doesn't matter if it's like the, the StarCraft show we do in, uh, in DreamHack Open, uh, because that's really, when, the, when we play the grand final and have the prize ceremony, it's really like obvious, some kind of hype going on in the, yeah. in the arena. But it could, hype for me can also be, if you do a, a really small Street Fighter tournament with 5,000 euros in the prize purse, mm. and you get 250 players, that's also hype for me. So I mean, it's a lot of different factors, but I think for us it's about uh, creating something that people really can talk about and buzz about online and also at the event. Something that is really appreciated by the community in each, in each game. And it's really different. I mean, the, the, the fighting community, for example, they appreciate a lot of diff uh, very different stuff than the StarCraft community, for example. So it's really hard to put one single. But I think all these numbers, if you like compare, as you say, spectator or viewer numbers with uh, attending players, I mean, all these numbers, is, it's just numbers. And I mean, you can do whatever you want with those numbers. And then uh, it's, it's really hard to compare between competitors. It's really hard to, to get uh, some, I mean, this is the key number. But obviously, the, the last two years, the most important part has been the 
the, the online production or let's say mm. that the, the viewers you can get online. Obviously, that's the reason we're focusing on StarCraft II and League of Legends at this event. Uh, they will have dedicated stages and uh, a kind of advanced production, both of those two games. So that's, I think that's the key factor the last two years. Uh, are, you, are you like everyone else in the sense that streaming numbers are kind of becoming the be all and end all uh, you know, for you guys? I, I see this a lot in esports where it's like after an event, the one thing people announce, you know, this is how many concurrent viewers we had, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is, is DreamHat moving in that direction, do, do you think? Yeah, I think we've at least been bragging about it a lot because we had, <laughs> I think we have some of the best numbers on Twitch actually in some of the games, yeah. uh, especially if you compare our... Uh, the actual quality of the teams and the casters we've had, and you compare that to, to other events, it's been really, really good. Um, because if you, but I think the online audience or the viewership you can get on Twitch or any other streaming channel, for that sake, uh, I think that's not the the the, mo the only important part. I think that it's also important to to please the audience on site, to make sure the players are all right and they have a good experience of the event. Uh, yeah. I think there's so many other, if you only want to please the online audience, it's really easy. Then you basically put up a show match between, I, I don't know, Slayish Boxers, Slayers, <laughs> Slayish Boxer and Fatality in like five different games or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not esports anymore, so I mean, um, I think it's a mix of different factors, but obviously the, the viewer numbers are very, very important for the sponsors right now. Um, but I, I, yeah. Um, what about, and this is just something that is, is on my mind, it might not follow on laterally, but because we're talking about streaming numbers and gaming popularity and, and that kind of thing, World of Tanks. Now, for me, it seems to be one of those games that's going to be very divisive within the community i've had the pleasure to work alongside some of the chaps at wargaming and they're lovely people i mean they really are they care about their game uh, they're definitely willing to throw money at their game but they want to make it a successful esports title however that's kind of going to be perceived by some people as they're going to buy themselves a prominent place in esports obviously we're going to see a world of tanks tournament at dreamhack so I guess my question to you would be, um, is it filthy, dirty money in exchange for pretending that you guys like the game? Or are you actually a genuine supporter of World of Tanks and do you think it can go on to have a prominent place at DreamHack? Yeah, just to, to get that straight first, World of mm -hmm. Tanks is an official tournament at DreamHack Summer, but it's also mm -hmm. co-produced with ESL and it's okay. Wargaming League, is it called Wargaming Nets? Yeah, Wargaming Net. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, something like that. So it's basically their own league at our event. And I, you have to remember the, the tradition or the history behind Dreamhack is that we started with esports be, just being a qualifier for World Cyber Games, ESWC, for, I don't remember, we had ESL and CPL here as well. So we, we're, we're coming from that history. So basically, mm. we were the platform, the arena for those other tournament brands. And then a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, we started to host our own tourna tournaments. But that doesn't mean we're still cooperating, or especially on DreamHack Summer and DreamHack Winter, we're working together with already existing leagues. For example, we will have the LCS here, um, the League of Legends Championship Series, and we will have uh, uh, the Wargaming uh, League as well. So that's basically a, a way to use DreamHack and the fans we have here and also to, 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 to create, I mean, great esports in more games than mm. games that we can support. So, I, but talking about World of Tanks, I mm. think they're doing the right thing. And I, I mean, they do doing TV commercials on the biggest TV channels in yeah. Sweden. <laughs> and they are really pushing that game. And you saw the, the Xbox One release. They were first out, I think, in the, <laughs> the E3 launch event. So, yeah. I mean, they are doing big stuff and I think it's a very, very cool game, actually. I, I've tried it myself. I haven't played, played it that much, but I think it's, it's doing something unique that you can't really find elsewhere um, because it's, 
it's <laughs> a cool and weird format. <laughs> and uh, I think they're doing something cool. Um, so and I, I want to keep DreamHack as a platform for those kind of games that really want to be the next eSport game and not only be... Because otherwise we would just do StarCraft Brood War in the last 20 years or something like that. And that, that's one of the reasons we, we, we moved on to CSGO as one of the first organizers, I mm. think. We just left 1.6 because we, we couldn't see any future in that game. Mm. Well, uh, I've got some more questions for you, but as what we do in the show is we quickly cut away to my lovely co-host James, the, the beautiful James Duffield, who's been out there in cyberspace. He's grabbing your tweets and tweaking them hard uh, to the point of arousal. Uh, he's also looking at the Reddit thread we've got going on. He's looking at our websites, that's cadred.org, Tech9, and uh, all the other community websites that are supporting this, and indeed all the celebrities uh, that love to get involved, all the esports celebrities. So, James, uh, what have people been saying? Have we had anyone say uh, what they think of DreamHack as an event? Is it the best esports event out there? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Well, no one's answered the question yet, so keep those questions. No one ever answers the answers fucking coming. question. We need no to get the question, the question of the day. Yeah. It should just so, be provocative statement of the day. Yeah, no, no one's really. Well. Yeah, and, and just, but we have yeah. had some questions, though. Okay, well. Uh, We've had what, some questions. Excellent, very, we'll jump in. Very related to you talking about different games that you've got going on, and you talked about before that you like the games which you like, and they're the sort of games you'd put into DreamHack. Aru in the chat says, can you let us in to know if there's any new games that you're looking to bring into DreamHack? I mean, the, the main uh, thing right now is that eSports needs a new FPS title. Uh, because CSGO is great um, in many ways, but it's not the title. It's not mm. as 1.6, for example. It, I, I would say, together with Brood War, 1.6 created, created esports, um, especially in the Western scene. And it was a, su such a dominating title when it comes to esports. So uh, we're really trying to find a new FPS title. I'm, I'm, we're looking for both an, a team game and, an, and a dual game, actually. Uh, and I think it's going to be there soon, but... Uh, are, there any upcoming, are there any upcoming games on the horizon that you think could I mean, do obviously, that, like Battlefield that? 4 right now is trying to do s the spectator mod and trying to move towards esports in some way. Uh, but I actually believe that the solution will be some kind of weird modification in them, just like Dota, just like Counter-Strike, just like all eSport games, basically, <laughs> except StarCraft. Um, it has to be some kind of community-driven, maybe, um, to, really blue, like, to really explode on the market, because I, I don't think Call of Duty or Battlefield is going to do the job in the end uh, that eSports really needs. Uh, so. I'm really looking forward. I don't have really have any prospect right now, uh, yeah. but well, go, to find go, going to FPS is, I suppose, that you've got now. Someone in chat, Happy Shepherd, said, "Was there any sponsor interest for Quake? How hard is it to find sponsors for Quake these days?" Yeah, what we decided this year is basically just doing Quake on Dreamhack Winter, and the reason was that we did two small tournaments every summer and winter, and it didn't really. It, it, it was big for the Quake community, but we didn't really excel or ma made it bigger um, for each event. So we're going to support it for DreamHack Winter and finding sponsors for that, yeah, it's really hard actually. Uh, there's no real hype around it as you have around League of Legends or StarCraft or all the other games. Um, yeah. So it's really hard, and, and uh, but ID Software is really easy to work with and it's I mean, it's a great game to host, actually. It's really easy to host as an organizer. And I mean, with the online platform and all the features they have, it's, it's, a, it's a great game. Uh, but it's, it's hard to, to find that budget you need. And the, and the community, the, the player base is so small as well. So, I mean, you, you have to have at least, uh, I don't know, maybe 100,000 gamers or something playing the game to actually have a viewer base in them. Yeah. Um, you, you spoke also earlier um, about uh, gaming on Swedish television on the, on the national TV channels. Uh, we had a couple of questions about that, in fact. Token89 asked, um, do you have to put a lot of effort to get the eSports onto SVT, or is it something that they suggested? Is that something that you have to try and try hard to get 
No. From the from the beginning, yes, that 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 was a two year process. Uh, starting small, doing really small broadcasts on SVT from the beginning. Um, I think that the, the core, uh, the the main thing we did was the the the, the Dream Arena as we call it, Dream Arena Extreme, which is our main grand final arena that we created on the DreamHack Summer and DreamHack Winter events. And we, tr we basically pitched that idea to, to sell a show or sell an arena show to SVT. Uh, that, that was, I think, the, the key thing behind getting SVT and getting the Swedish television excited about esports, because then they we didn't put a lot of in-game footage in their face. We basically put uh, pictures of people sharing in the audience, uh, winners getting the the prize or, uh, the the prizes in the end, and you could really sell that moment. And I think Swedish television, their their public service, they are funded not by the government, but they are funded by like a license fee. So basically, they they have a, a they they have to basically provide not entertainment, but programming about every subculture out there. So we, we, we find the perfect partner for it because they, they, they had to start small and suddenly we are actually one of the biggest online broadcasts they have on their uh, uh, online um, uh, TV uh, channel. So, I mean, they have really been part of the progress instead of us like pitching uh, some, something really big and then it fails or it's getting successful so yeah so the reception's been good from SVT yeah absolutely and if, if you look at for example the top ratings if that week we're broadcasting we're I think we're to the top three show online uh, in Sweden on all mm. online uh, TV uh, so the, the main thing for them is to getting the online audience but they also um, broadcast it on linear TV or terrestrial TV as a complement to that or let's say an extra bonus or something because our audience, the viewers we have and the, the, the community, we, they, they don't watch TV anymore. They, they basically sit in front of the computer. So, yeah. Well, that's, um, that's all I've got for now, but keep your okay. questions coming. Um, keep them in uh, hashtag esports heaven on Twitter or in the chat on Reddit or on Tech9 on Cadre, just keep your questions coming now. And also answer the question that's on the screen now. Um, is DreamHack the best sports event? Let us know. I'll keep reading. Okay, right. Well, thanks for that, James. And uh, definitely try and answer the question this time, guys. It'd be, it'd be fantastic if we could. Um, I'm going to change tack a little bit here, uh, 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 Thomas. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is kind of what it's like working at DreamHack because... Um, you know, I, I, I attend the events, I hang out with the guys, I'm there during the after parties when everyone's having drinks and stuff. And uh, Robert, uh, you know, seems to be a very gregarious kind of guy. He always plays down, you know, even though he calls himself the boss, he always plays down how hands-on he actually is. He says the secret of his success is he just delegates to people who are smarter than him. But uh, is it... <laughs> really this kind of like utopian company that's like fantastically fun to work for or is it actually when you get down to it just like an office job you go in you work you've got to be disciplined long hours and so forth it's definitely long hours i think everyone works minimum 10 to 12 hours per day or more uh but but i think the working environment we're a really small company but we're actually 12 or 13 full-time right now, which is really small compared to maybe Turtle or to MLG or some other eSport companies. But uh, we are also 700 in some events. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. we're very organic. <laughs> and in some events, we, as the, the, the dedicated eSports events, we're maybe 30 to 40. So we're, we're very, we're stretching all the time. Um, and that's a, a huge task for us because, or a huge thing, because we have to really be smart about organize, organizing everything and give uh, everyone a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, they have to uh, get a lot of power or, uh, sorry, I can't find the word. Um, and it, they really, we really need to make sure that we are not getting all the decisions up to mm. Robert's level, basically. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, you, if you have DreamHack Summer and DreamHack Winter, for example, we have basically 
teams that they're just doing their thing, like the tech team doing the network, or they, some of the esport teams, they, they have been doing these tournaments for four or five years, and they, they take a lot of pride to do that also. So we're trying to really push the uh, power down to the people actually doing the work. Uh, but if it, is it a normal office job? Yes, it is. Uh, in many ways, but mm. the, the fun part is that we really we're really working with uh, a lot of crazy stuff all the time and uh, We're doing new stuff as well. I think that's why Dreamax been a little bit of a trending topic the last uh, one or two years because mm. so we we have been doing new shows new formats trying to evolve and do something new um, and We should carry on with that. I mm. think um, what, what's Robert like as a boss? Like, do you interact with him? I mean, I guess the question is, what's the boss like as a boss? Because uh, he says, you know, he's not hands-on, but I can't believe that a company as successful as DreamHack doesn't have a, a visionary behind it. Be you know, Robert's kind of synonymous with DreamHack in the same way that, you know, Sundance is with MLG, or, you know, you can think of numerous examples. Uh, I, I would say we're, we're probably four or five people that's maybe leading the direction of Remac. Uh, and Robert is definitely a huge part of that. He's, he's been, uh, uh, he, he's basically the gut feeling of Remac. So uh, mm. he, he's uh, taking a lot of, I would say, it, risky decisions when it comes to Remac. Well, uh, for example, the, the ice hockey arena, the first time we did the StarCraft production in the ice hockey arena, we basically, that one of our most expensive productions so far. We basically had zero, zero sponsorship for that from the start. And we just hired Arena, hired the tech staff and did it. And that led up to us doing the, the WCS Europe the year after because of that. So, I mean, he's, uh, he has a really good gut feeling. But I think we're, we're around four or five people. Um, with different expertise that are maybe developing in DreamHack and setting up the strategy, setting up the, the long-term strategy and the short-term strategy. So uh, it's, it's a teamwork. And uh, I think DreamHack, it, uh, we, we used to say in the office that the hardest part is to get your idea through the office and everyone approves it. Because if everyone approve, approves it in the DreamHack office, it's going to be a, a great uh, project in the end that you start. Uh, so that's uh, it's a really hard pro process, and we're screaming a lot in the office. Everyone is angry all the time and, and happy the hour after. So, um, well, okay, let's talk about that kind of uh, mix of people that come to the table. I mean, uh, it, it, how how does how does it work? Does everyone come to the table with an equal saying, or do, does anyone have veto yeah. power, or how does it work? No, I think it's very equal, cool, actually. It's very Swedish. I mean, I, I'm not sure you, you guys didn't watch the Eurovision, but they had like a, a, a short segment about the Swedishness uh, in that part. And it's, it's mm. I'm not sure what we call it in Sweden, but it, everything is going to be like a very flat organization. Um, so I think we're kind of, we're very equal in the office. Mm. Uh, but obviously, I have a lot of, uh, input when it comes to esports, we have another guy very, that have a huge input when it comes to like actual event production, and uh, Robert has a lot of when it comes to the the financial part, obviously, and mm -hmm. what we're gonna move focus on. So, uh, yeah. Has has it. there has there ever been a, a moment where someone's you know made a decision, everyone's kind of agreed and gone for it around the table, and then it's it's been a disaster. <laughs> Like something maybe we wouldn't know about because you know you you fix it before we get into a catastrophic disaster. That's a good question, actually. We had some terrible events, actually. Really? Uh, but I don't what remember them out? now. Um, I think it's a good event. Not the last two years, maybe, but before that, we had some terrible events. But that was just we just said yes to everything. Uh, you have to learn to say no to a lot of stuff. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, 
it's not good to do everything. And that's something that we've been working on the last two years is to focus on the festivals, summer, winter, and the esports part, where we're trying to build two championships Dreamhack Op Open, that's mm -hmm. in the future going to be more games than StarCraft, and the Swedish championship that's really booming here in Sweden right now with the third, third season coming up this autumn. So, yeah, so. I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of going to push you yeah. a little bit because I, I want to I want to lift the veil. I, I, there's yeah. got to be something that stands out in your mind as being a fuck up, you know, a mistake uh, that you know that you guys have then learned from and, and, and corrected. What would be your perception of perhaps one of the examples of a big dream hack error? Uh. Everyone's saying coin flip. And stuff like that. I mean, yeah, we're, we're still doing coin flip. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't changed that. But when it comes to actually win, I think we did a terrible. Or we can take a tournament. I think we did a terrible Counter Strike event a couple of years ago, uh, where the, the teams played until four in the night, and it was just awful for everyone. But. I think, I mean, you're doing mistakes all the time and you're trying to learn from that. That's the, the most important thing. And uh, I think as an event coordinator and a project manager in this business, you have to learn that you can't satisfy everyone. It's just make sure that if you have five different parties, make sure they everyone above 50% satisfied and then it's a good event because a lot of people is going to be pissed off. and. Just deal with it. Uh, but learning from doing bad scheduling, doing having bad tor tournament PCs, all, all that is something in the history, hopefully. Uh, but a particular event, I think DreamHack Winter 2009, if I remember correctly, was a really bad event for us. I think a couple of people in the office just wanted to quit and everything was just a disaster. I, I don't remember the esports. We basically tried a, a lot of new stuff and just did esports in games that we don't really love. Um, yeah. I don't remember what tournament it was right now, but it was a really bad event. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll ask you a slightly easier question now. Yeah. Um, I, I think companies <clears throat> within esports, a lot of the times we're not just identified by um what we are you know what we do where our area of expertise is we're also kind of identified a little bit by what we're not and uh, who our rivals are and and we've seen in the past that you know there have been certain people trying to if you like take on dreamhack to have their events running at a similar time to kind of you know have some friendly I suppose it would be called friendly competition with, with DreamHack. So my question to you would be, do DreamHack have anyone in mind that they look over at and think, we want to be better than those guys, we want to fuck those guys? And, you know, is there any rivalries that DreamHack as a company has collectively? Not really anymore, I think. Mm. And we're stealing so much <laughs> from all the competitors all the time. I mean, you, you're going to other other events and you are watching on the stream and you see like some little feature or something that they do good in the event production and you just steal it and try to do a, um, something better out of it at your event. So I, I don't really, I think Robert is using the word frenemy all the time and I think it's kind of a good way because well, obviously ESL is a, a competitor but it's also, they're also friends. I mean we're, we're cooperating on I think three or four tournaments this uh, event, this summer event. So, I mean, we are working closely with them. And I mean, we're, we're talking all the time on Skype on different ideas, helping each other, trying to find different solutions or just share ideas. So there's not that, that kind of, I, I think that the fans or the community is more eager to like push that idea that we are yeah. rivals. And I think what, Definitely, eSport needs the, the, those, that kind of competition. Uh, but on the other hand, in many ways, eSports also need cooperation because mm. I think that, that's one of the good parts, for example, with Blizzard stepping in with the, the, the StarCraft, uh, the WCS, that you, for example, can get, an, get a ranking over, across all events instead of having one ranking at ESL, one ranking at MLG, and DreamHack mm. is doing their... their uh, 
their own thing. So I mean, I mean uh, that that kind of stuff is I think it's important to 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 have. Mm. Now someone is stepping in. It's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling there'd be some guest appearances yeah. uh, at some point. It's good to see him again. We had a lovely a lovely talk on climbing the ladder. Uh, which is a Chris Chan show. If you haven't watched that, you should definitely uh, tune into that. I'm a co-host on that one. Uh, yeah, but yeah he's, he's a lovely guy, Hellspawn. We, we've, me and him have buried the hatchet. We used to be, <laughs> we, 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 we used to be uh, less than friends, but uh, we're all good buddies now. Yeah. Um, cool. What areas do you think personally DreamHack is innovating in when it comes to esports? Because I think we um, we talk a lot about making things better, improving, learning from mistakes. One of the things I love about DreamHack is they, they're they not afraid to try something new, and they do bring a lot of new ideas executed very well to the eSports table. So what are you most proud of in terms of innovation? Um, I think first, when it comes to eSports and when it comes to e media production, I think uh, the arena show, as we call it, the, the show we're, we're created with DreamHack Open, as you can see in StarCraft 2, where we're trying to push the players to be a little bit more stars than they really are, uh, to walk out on the stage, to have a format where we're not that... We're, it's a very entertaining format. It's not the long interviews. The, uh, it's more of a very casual mainstream format but at the same time at those tournaments we have a very like community a long format with a lot of matches and 96 players so we're trying to combine the show with having something really community close to the community uh, mm. that that's in my opinion that's uh, something that's uh, that I'm proud proud of or where I think we we stand out and the, the, the the actual how we do the arena show actually also because it's not it's not an American feeling about it it's more of a European just it's esports and obviously we have Apollo there doing his doing his uh, amazing work <laughs> and but we still have like an uh, like in control casually on the stage talking about anything actually just to mm. To, to get the mainstream audience interested in, uh, of esports, so I think the arena show is one thing. The other part is that we we, we still keep the, the like the pro am concept on DreamHack yeah. Summer and Winter. At, at, in every tournament we host, almost <laughs> you can actually go with your own computer to the event and qualify for the main tournament and go to the grand final. We saw that happen in the first StarCraft tournament with Mana, I think. Mana just bought a t uh, ticket to the LAN, uh, played the qualifier, went to the grand final, was beaten by his teammate Nama <laughs> in the end, but that, that storyline is really, really cool. And after that, he could probably sign an even better contract. So, yeah. Uh, I think that the pro-am or mixing professionals and amateurs has been one of the core uh, values in, in uh, in our esports strategy. Um, do you ever envision a time where <clears throat> maybe the festival and the esports element of it, I mean, for example, could DreamHack in the form we know it, could, could it exist if the festival wasn't there? Would it exist if the festival wasn't there? Um, five years ago, no, but it could exist today, I think. I mean, when I started at DreamHack, we didn't even have a, like a e dedicated budget or anything for esports. It was just a, something in the in the big event, um, and it was maybe one percent of the event. Now it's actually budget-wise, it's I'm not sure how many percentage is, but it's probably thirty percent or something. And it's uh, we have dedicated people working with only esports now, and uh, we're doing all events outside uh, DreamHack that's not LAN parties, it's actually eSport events. Either state shows, like the one you saw in Stockholm, or uh, smaller events. We're doing a lot of sm small events, actually, here in Sweden, for example. So, um, I mean, I think definitely DreamHack could be separated uh, from mm. uh, the LAN in the long run. <laughs> I, I think the future for you guys is probably in the tour, and, and that kind of brings me to my... Uh, next question, I know you guys are keen to branch out and to have 
uh, event. So, uh, you know, as far afield as possible. Um, everyone always asks me the same thing. Like, ask them, when are they going to come to America? Uh, are we likely to see that soon? Or is there another country on the horizon, maybe UK, for example, first? I think the primary focus has been um, the last year and also the upcoming year has been Europe, actually. I think that there is much work to be done in Europe. Uh, and the reason is that, and it's, it's, not, it's not related to ESL, but it's been really um, focused on the, uh, the German trade shows, basically CBIT yeah. Gamescom and a little bit uh, ESWC in Paris, obviously, but it's been... It's not been spread out in Europe as it should be. I mean, we, that's why we launched in Spain, for example. We're having one event in Bucharest, Romania, and we want to have at least one or two more events in Europe. And UK could be a possible country, maybe Russia or maybe, I don't know, uh, France. We're, we're talking to a lot of different partners and different scenarios, but definitely focus on Europe and get one or two more events first. Mm -hmm. After that, maybe do something outside Europe, like US or something. Uh, that's at least my opinion. Um, <laughs> and I think that's what we've been discussing in the office, actually. Yeah. And I think Europe is such a big market. And uh, I also think the DreamHack brand is, is very strong in Europe as well. Uh, I mean, especially in Eastern Europe, where there is a strong brand there. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of Russian teams coming on Saturday, for example. Um, and they are coming over recent. So uh, we, we definitely want to, to have a huge presence in Europe. Uh, and uh, I think that it's a little bit of a black hole in Europe still when it comes to esports. So you don't really have those kind of events you, uh, that, where people can go and compete in five or six, seven different uh, tournaments and have a state show and have a good, good atmosphere. And I think we can create that. Um, we're a bit different to everyone else because we want to have our own independent events. We don't want to go. We want. Yeah. We don't want to be a part of someone else, like a trade show, for example. Yeah. I'm glad that you uh, used the word independent there because it ties in nicely with my last question. Before I'm going to throw you back to James and the wolves of Twitch TV chat. Um, and it, it's for me perhaps the most important thing I'm, I'm going to ask you. Dreamhack for me is probably one of the few true independent esports organizations in that what they do is based around community it's based around uh, as you say hype popularity but you don't seem to be in bed with anyone to the point where they're going to subvert dreamhack and make you do things that you don't want to do uh, we've seen two goods uh, who i know is obviously got strong ties with, with DreamHack, who's always talking about how he won't work with companies he doesn't want any any part of and, and things like that. Now, you guys do stand alone in that sense. So do you view yourself as being the, a truly independent esports organization or are people that champion you for that? Are they being a bit naive? I think it's a little bit tricky to use the word independent because what what's the definition of independent in this uh, case? I mean, uh, Turtle Entertainment, for example, is all, or ESL is also an independent company. In my, I mean, I don't see them as a owned by someone else, um, uh, or the same with M and G. But I think that when it comes to to, to DreamHack um, and why we maybe are called independent is that we, we don't really rely on someone else. We, we're standing on our own mm. <laughs> on our own legs and we can do a little bit what we want because we have our own fans. We have actually people paying to participate in our events uh, as either participants or viewers or, I mean, we, 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 we try to work for the people that are buying the tickets in the end and not uh, working for someone else. And we're, we're a private company. We don't have any uh, weird uh, uh, owners in that uh, way. Uh, so I, that's maybe why people call us independent. But I don't like the word independent at all, actually. I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it feels weird to, to be called that a little bit because uh, what, what do you really mean there uh, in the end? They, What's the requirements to be an independent esport organizer? Um, I don't, I don't have the requirements, so I can't really see ourselves as the only independent organizer. But maybe, maybe 
maybe that's the case. I'm not sure. Okay, well, um, we will leave it there. It's interesting that you yeah. should say that. I'm sure it's something we will come back to maybe uh, when we have uh, Sean Apollo Clark on in a moment. But uh, don't go anywhere just yet, Thomas, because uh, we're going to go over to James now, who has been plundering the Twitter sphere like a Randy E. Pirate or something. Um, he's going to be presenting your questions and statements and all the other nonsense that we get from you lot on the internet to Thomas just before he goes. So, James, what have you got for us? Well, we have had some answers about whether DreamHack is the best esports event. Someone said, uh, what was it, Paul Mantras on Twitter said, yes, yes it is. <laughs> um, but then uh, Jules on Twitter also said, how can DreamHack be the best event when for bizarre reasons it was excluded from WCS? Never understood this decision. Someone in chat also brought up, it was last year, WCS Europe was the best event of the year, and this year, how did it happen, why? Why is it not a thing? So, yeah. yeah. Should I answer that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, do you, yeah. How did it happen, it, basically? How, why, why did it happen? It's a good question. I think you have to look at a lot of different factors. Um, and I think ESL is doing a, a great job with WCS in Europe. And I think for us, it's actually be really good because we, we have never had a, a closer or more connected relationship with Blizzard than, than now. Uh, we're, we're talking to them about a lot of different stuff and have a lot of input in the WCS that's outside the actual league. Uh, so uh, um, I'm actually happy about the situation in many ways. Um, uh, and I think we're, we're playing an important part in, in WCS still. Uh, even though we're not uh, the European operator. Um, and I think that the main reason to answer the question a little bit, I, you, have to see, you, you have to have a little bit background to, to see the difference between DreamHack and, and ESL. ESL is a much bigger company. They, they have a totally different infrastructure. We, ha we, we for example, have never hosted a, a league like WCS. Uh, we don't have a TV studio. We don't have a... Uh, that kind of framework or that kind of platform that ESL have. Uh, so I definitely think ESL is a good fit for that. Uh, so, uh, but of course, we, we want to be involved as much as possible with every publisher. It doesn't matter if it's Blizzard or someone else, actually. Uh, we want to work closely with them. So, and we're happy about doing that now. Uh, this tournament is going to be the, the second tier one tournament in WCS, I think, ever. <laughs> so I think it's only been two DreamHack tournaments that have been part of the non-WCS so far. I, I may be wrong, so, uh, but I think so. So we're working closely with them, and I think what Blizzard is doing is... <coughs> oh, sorry, I have to... <laughs> you killed him. Oh, sorry. Whoever yeah, asked yeah, that sorry. question killed I'm him. Yeah. I hope yeah, but happy I, guys. <clears throat> You, you have to see that the vision about, or the vision and the, 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 the goal with WCS, and it's really good when it comes to the ranking part and also trying to organize the world of StarCraft because everyone can agree that the last year was oversaturated. It was a lot of problems related to the situation we had, so, uh, and they're trying to solve that, and I think it's good. Yeah. Oh, you were saying before about um, DreamPack in relation to esports and the festival. And uh, just before that, the, the, the big boss, Robert, said in, uh, in chat, DreamHack is not just esports, we're a festival. And he, he, a couple of people replied to that, that if, if uh, DreamHack wasn't a festival, they just wouldn't go. <laughs> and it's, I suppose it's not the team saying this, obviously, but a couple of people, no, no festival death for DreamHack. Traveling to Yonkerping just for esports, no thank you. So do you think it needs the festival side of it to survive still? I know you think it... Do you think that it would lose a lot of appeal to some people? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I answered that question weird last time, but w what I'm saying is that um, DreamHack is the festival. We, we, festival is our core business, and that's what we do. But I'm just saying that esports is such so, so big within DreamHack, so it could basically be a different. It could be somewhere else in the Ericsson Globe or in uh, uh, in Spain or in UK, or it. We could do separate stage shows that actually 
get people to those events with only esports as content. Uh, that's the, yeah. what we realized two years ago when we did our first StarCraft, our separate StarCraft event in Stockholm. Uh, and we actually got, at that time, I think 500 people, but they actually bought a ticket just to watch esports. And that, that was a unique thing with StarCraft 2 that you could actually um, make separate esports events where people only went as a spectator. And we yeah. should really be thankful about that for, for Blizzard creating such a great game and creating that community because it's never happened before. Um, I've been to so many events, CPL back in the days in Dallas, and there was no people there. It was no one watched. And it was the same thing with, it was basically ESWC that did it, but I, I'm not sure what kind of ticket price it was there back in the days. Uh, but to sell tickets only on the eSport experience, that's possible today, and I think that's something that's going to grow the upcoming years as well. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, they were, the people in chat were also talking a bit more about the festival. They're asking where would it go next, the festival. Like, I know we could move eSports events around because there's still maybe only 500 people paying for tickets, but when the festival like, overgrows Elmia, where would it go next? Someone suggested the moon. Uh, yeah. I think that. <laughs> Maybe, maybe Robert not. is always talking about the moon, so that could definitely oh, be a destination. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. He does spend half his life living yeah. on it. So yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. it's only, uh, it's Dreamhack like moon. I would no, go there. I think we're going to stay here for a while, actually. Um, at least, I mean, we, we are used to this venue, and it's a little bit part of the Dreamhack spirit to be here as well. It's like we, we, we like to be here in John Shipping. Uh, so, yeah. may, maybe we move it to, to the moon. Maybe. Well, Sorry, apparently, I think, I think the moon might be a bit too mainstream because the boss has just said Mars in chat. So, maybe we'll go Mars next. Yeah. He's always one step ahead, that fuck. <laughs> he always does. Yeah, I think that that's, that's pretty much all we've had in terms of the qu answering the question. Okay. Well, uh, James, do stay manning the Twitter uh, yes, channels and, and Reddit. And, and look, send, send stuff in. Give the guy something to do. He's... He, look at him. See, look, he's, he's, he's just wasting away to nothing. Uh, that, Thomas, I, I will just say, look, I, I want to thank you loads for coming on. Um, I know that uh, you're right in the thick of it at the moment. We certainly heard that earlier. There was some guy going hammer crazy. I think it was the new Mario game, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but look, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'll see you in a few days when I travel out there and uh, just... Speaking personally, I know DreamHack's always an awesome event. I'm sure everyone who's watching this show uh, agrees with me. So do continue uh, with your supreme efforts because uh, they are appreciated by many people. Thanks. Nice talking to you guys. No worries. Nice to be here. I'm glad. I'm glad. I will, I will say I'll see you in a few days. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go for a quick break, people. So I want you to keep thinking about the hash esports heaven tag on Twitter. I want you to keep thinking about is DreamHack the best esports event? Try and answer that. Maybe you've got an experience. I did see one guy in chat say that he went there and tried to eat uh, one of each flavor dime bar and ended up being sick. So, um, you know, DreamHack, it's a bit of a mixed bag for everyone. Sounds good. Uh, that yeah, well, <laughs> we're going to have a, a little five minute break where we're going to run some videos or some music or whatever it is our producer Gareth does. Uh, and after the break, we're going to have the man, the, the, the voice and kind of a face, but mainly the voice um, of StarCraft 2. It is Sean Apollo Clark, perhaps one of the greatest casters in any title in the world. He's going to be coming on because, of course, he'll be at DreamHack and he's going to talk a little bit about his experience as a caster. So no hell this week. It's all heaven. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in five minutes.
We're back. Hope you enjoyed that break. I always thought we had some nice videos to watch, but you've just been staring at a white screen. I apologize for that. Fire this producer again. We get through them. We do get through them, but uh, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll, any suggestions for stuff that you want to watch while we're uh, off having a wee, which is what we do, by the way. Uh, that's the only reason we take a break at all, because I've got an old man bladder. Um, anyway, uh, right, so we're about to have a very special guest, but just before we do go into that... Uh, I'm just going to rep the hashtag one time. That's hash esports heaven. Any questions for the next guest I'm about to introduce or just to answer the great question is DreamHack the best esports event ever? Um, we certainly think it is. Um, but yeah, give us your answers. Maybe you've had a horrible DreamHack experience. Um, I went to one LAN once, I won't name the LAN, where someone actually had explosive diarrhea while they were playing a game. And it was that was really bad. It wasn't DreamHack, but uh, that was not a good LAN. So those are the kind of stories we'd like to get. Anyway, moving away from diarrhea, uh, we're going to come to... <laughs> I can't even believe, what the fuck am I talking about? Apollo, the greatest StarCraft II caster in the world. Uh, to, I think so, anyway. Um, he's going to be at uh, DreamHack, no doubt about it. He is the voice of StarCraft II and indeed the voice of DreamHack now. Um, and we're going to pick his brains about his DreamHack experiences. Sean, I cannot thank you enough for joining us. I know it was short notice, but uh, I really appreciate having you on. Oh, it's, uh, you're more than welcome, mate. I love your stuff. I told you this before. I know you. As you, long as there's kind. no ambushes and as long as you don't attack me too hard, I'm here. <laughs> I, I've got nothing bad to say about you, and I can't even think of a, 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 an angle to ambush you with. Uh, I, I wish I did because it would keep up my reputation as the esports bad guy. So uh, I'll go away and work on that. But um, what's been going on for you at the moment? Because I know you're obviously in prep for DreamHack. <laughs> so uh, what's happening in Apollo's life right now? I've uh, been really busy, actually. Um, the last couple of weeks, I was in Germany for WCS uh, Premier League. And then a few days later, I went off to Korea for the season finals. And I got back just a couple of days. And I'm in Sweden now and doing Dream Act tomorrow the next day. So I've uh, just been really busy, actually. Hardly any time to play the game. Just lots of commentary, lots of tournaments to be at. Uh, is, is the traveling starting to get to you a little bit? Because I fucking hate traveling. I mean, I really hate it. Like, I, I, you know, and I don't do half as much as you do. Um, I, in all honesty, I, it's not as bad as last November. Last November was one of the worst months of my life. Even though, you know, if, if you just look at traveling in itself, it, it's it is amazing. But when you do it so often, it's yeah. not as amazing. And I think last November, I did something stupid like four events in a row every weekend across three different continents. So I was in China. Sweden for DreamHack. I went over to, to IPL and MLG. I don't know the whole lot. Uh, that was the worst month. And ever since then, I, was, I said to myself that I wasn't going to do more than two events a month. Um, WCS is a little bit different because it's more of a league. It was just you know a couple of hours a day. Um, but yeah, it, it does get to you. It does get to you. Um, is DreamHack then kind of, where are we at with that? I mean, because I know, like so again, I'm speaking from experience. When I have events that I attend, I go, Chore, chore, oh, fucking awful, would rather not be there, but I'm looking forward to this one. That's actually a party event. I'm looking forward to going there. I can have fun. So is, is DreamHack there, or is it actually uh, a lot of work for you? Um, to be honest, I'm at a position where every, every job I do, because I can pick what I want to do, um, just you know, in, in a lucky position I am, um, where everything is what I want to do, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. For example, the Premier League, of course, it's great. Season 1 Finals, great. DreamHack, great. Everything's great. Um, so it's it's always good to come back to DreamHack because DreamHack was uh, one of the first organizations that basically said, all right, especially in the early days when I first started commentating, they were like, all right, we don't really know exactly who you are and what you're going to do, but welcome. <laughs> and uh, they let me in. Uh, so th they were kind of my first home, really. Um, well, right, just before we start moving on and we, we do plunge into the DreamHack questions, let's talk a bit about just you, again, being in demand, being that guy. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot about shoutcasters on this show. We even did a shoutcasting special. You remember I was desperately clamoring for guests on that one and I was tweaking your ear back then, uh, you know, eight, eight, ten weeks ago, whenever it was, um, because I think you're a great example of somebody that can go from being, you know, I, I would say... Not not an amateur caster. I don't want to. I don't want to start there. But somebody who's had a you know a meteoric rise to being iconic in the industry. So how 
how has all that happened and, and how have you managed to keep your feet on the ground? Um, it happened really fast, actually. Um, I think a lot of people recognize that the rise from where I've begun to where I'm now happened in a very, 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 very short period of time compared mm -hmm. to the other people in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, Day and I and Tastosis, they're all brutal commentators or brutal personalities. Now I just came to StarCraft 2 on a bottom level playing field and just rose up from there. Um, I don't know. I, I I always put it down to hard work, I, I think, because I, I do believe that I'm one of the hardest workers. I do. I put in a lot of effort for everything I do. And people just enjoyed it. And they continue to enjoy it. And because they enjoyed it, um, organizations were like, you know, why is the community you know following this guy so much? So they gave me opportunities. And it just kind of continued on like that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, what about... Uh, right. Imagine you're a, just a StarCraft II fan. Just one of those guys out there in cyberspace. He's he's you're listening to you doing a cast. What do you think is good about what you do? Um, I think that I, the thing that I like to look at myself and think I'm really good at is that I'm pretty professional. Um, I talk. I don't. I don't. When I commentate, I really like to focus on the game and what the game means and evolve my casting around the game rather than making jokes. And I think I'm just very straightforward when it comes to a commentator. I can be funny. I think that was witnessed this weekend with, with Day 9. We were giggling a lot, as we always do when we work together. But at the same time, I'm, I'm very much so about bringing the best commentary that there's ever been. I think that's one of my personal goals from being a commentator. I want to bring the best of the best. So that's what I usually aim to do. And when people come in, hopefully they can see the difference when, when I work. Who's your biggest inspiration? Like, Who do you watch and think, I'm going to be like that guy? Ah, so that's a difficult question because uh, I think it's changed throughout the years, actually. Um, well, t talk us through the phases. Talk us through your development. I mean, you know, and I can totally identify with that, actually. It's like almost like <laughs> sporting heroes or, or yeah. uh, from a writing perspective, you know, like I, I started out wanting to be fucking William Burroughs and then it became Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> you know, now who the fuck just, you know, so so talk us through the phases. Who who were your idols at the key points in your career? Um, I guess originally um, when I first started commentating, I guess it was Day9 uh, who kind of was the guy that started StarCraft 2 that everybody, you know, went to when it when it comes to StarCraft commentary. So I, obviously I was like, all right, let's try and look what he, what he does. It then evolved over pretty fast to Artosis because he caught up and become one of the better commentators, if not the best, and still is uh, regarded as one of the best. Um, Too Good, I, I learned a lot from Too Good actually when it comes to commentary, uh, especially when moving to Sweden. He taught me a lot of things, um, you know, to to just improve myself in general. So I looked up a lot to him. Uh, and then in recent days, actually, I, I I've said this to a couple of people, not really publicly or on streams or anything. Uh, but I think one of the best commentators in esports is Jat, Riot Jat from League of Legends. Mm. Um, I think it's really, really good. And, I, and I've watched a couple of his uh, casts, actually. And I, I've tried to look up to a, to a couple of things he does. Um, I guess that's kind of it, really. Everyone's loving Jat at the moment, actually. I've got to say that. Like, uh, I think when we had Wheat on the show, he said the same thing. Uh, DJ Wheat as well. I kind of forgot I should have mentioned him. Oh, that's all right. Everyone mentions we. I think it's like a given. Like if you're a shoutcaster, there's like everyone pays him a royalty if you fucking you know if you if you're doing it and making any money from it. Because I think he was inspirational pretty much to everyone. You know, even people like me who don't you know work in casting or whatever. You yeah. know, it's inspirational to uh, to to just everyone in esports. It's on some level. It's, um, I just feel that I, I I really do swing a lot and look at everybody and try to learn from everybody because I think everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and I think I do as well. Um, and I, I like to learn bits and pieces from everyone. So I look at different people at different periods through my casting career and actually just been in career as well uh, recently. My next kind of project, not really project, but what I want to look into a lot more is the Korean style of casting. Mm -hmm. um, a three-way cast is something I, I'm toying around with talking to people about that I want to try and introduce into English StarCraft commentary, so I think over the next 12 months that may happen. Uh, I really want to push that. And also the analysts from, just, no, they're just the cast in general. In, in English, it seems very laid back. It yeah. seems very casual, but the Korean cast is very hyped. And I even took a moment's notice when I was casting with Day9 this weekend to look over to the Korean guys to my right, 
and even the analyst, which I knew was an ex-pro gamer, um, was screaming down the microphone, his, his analyst and what he had to say. So I think there's a lot to learn from them. It's just obviously very difficult because of the, the language barrier. Yeah. Um, but I think that's one of the, I think Jack right now is the guy I'm looking at a lot to, and see what he does and also the crane casters for sure. Okay. So last question before we do move on to DreamHack focus stuff and then we'll, we'll come back a little bit to some other bits and pieces while you're here. Uh, lots to talk about. But uh, I, I, retirement, man. Like Obviously, uh, when I was kind of first getting into StarCraft and, and, and learning about it because I knew it was going to be kind of something I would need to get involved in if I wanted to be viable in, in you know, my job, um, I still remember you being a player. Um, and, you know... I, always, I, I was always following your results quite keenly. And then there seemed to be this shift where it would be, you know, you weren't playing as much. You were, you were building yourself up as a caster. And then, you know, obviously you, you have gone full-time casting and, and no longer pursuing the dream. Um, do you look at sort of things like the WCS and everything that StarCraft II has gone on to achieve and, and have maybe a, a pang, right? I wish I was still playing at the highest level a little bit. Or? Uh, I think... That, that makes my commentary very special is I usually, when I cast, think I'm playing. Uh, and honestly, when I, when I cast from different perspectives, I wish it was me. And, I, and I, I try to explain what, you know, if I was in their position, what would I do and what, you know, what happens in the game. And I think that's a, one of the, one of the styles that makes me pretty good is that I used to be a pro player back in the day. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I miss it a lot, actually. Um, I slowly gravitated towards commentary because it was just the natural progression of, of what I was going through at that point. But to answer your question straight up, man, I, yeah, of course, absolutely. I think I think anybody that's been involved in pro gaming that doesn't do it anymore looks back. I mean, you got people like Odie and Red Eye that like, back in the day when I used to be a player, <laughs> I used to do all this. Yeah, I think everybody has has that inside them. I mean, is it... I mean, what 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 is the difference in f feelings? I guess like because you know when you win a game yeah. and you think, yeah, I fucking own that guy. That's sweet. Like, do you get anything that equates to that feeling from a good cast, a job well done? Um, so you do, but it's at different parts. It, it's really weird because when you're playing, you don't have this emotional flood until the GG's called. Even though you're winning the game, it, the flood never hits you. Uh, as a player, so what you'll see from players is that as they're playing, you know they're they're very concentrated, and then as soon as that GG is called, as soon as you see the GG on the screen, then it just all comes flooding in all at once, and you get hit really really hard. Yeah. As a caster, it happens during the game because you can see what's gonna happen, and you you know what you know how the game's gonna go. So that's where that the where, I mean I think one of the biggest examples was probably at the DreamHack. Um, Tournament, the last DreamHack Open tournament, where we had Naniwa versus Jadong, and, and Naniwa beat Jadong. On the one of the maps, me and Artosis were going crazy because both of us knew what it meant and he was about to win. And so that excitement just comes a little bit earlier and is expressed earlier in, into the game than, than a player would afterwards. Okay. Right. So, DreamHack. You said it was your first home. Uh, let's talk about your relationship with, with, with DreamHack. Uh, were you ever. Was there ever a time when you were kind of looking at a DreamHack event and saying, wow, I'd, I'd fucking love to go to one of those? Um, no, because I, okay. I did the first StarCraft II DreamHack thing. The, the, the first StarCraft II DreamHack I did, um, and I've done everyone since. And I never really looked at any DreamHacks before that, actually, right. um, in terms of tournaments and what they they, they did. I, I'd actually been to a DreamHack before, not as a, not as a commentator, but as a player. I just got randomly sent to it to play, uh, God, what was that RTS game? I can't even remember the name of it, but I played some RTS game for, for Dignitas, and I went there, so I kind of knew what it was. It was just a big LAN for me at the time, because back then, eSports at DreamHack was small, and it wasn't mm -hmm. that big. It was more of a LAN and a festival, as, Rob, as uh, Greycon mentioned earlier. Um, so I was happy I was at the first StarCraft 2 DreamHack one. Mm -hmm. Oh, what about kind of ingratiating yourself w with the guys i mean how how is it i mean like because i know they're doing this now with kind of community casters i mean did they did they reach out to, to you specifically how how did you get that initial relationship um so the first tournament i did with with uh, dreamhack i think i emailed graycon 
actually. Um, and it, it was the same because my first ever proper tournament was in Touch Street Masters and it was exactly the same process of how I got the job oh. is that I emailed them being like, hey guys, uh, you know, Day Nine's casting your event. I see he's the only guy announced at the moment. I don't know if you have another one, but I'd, be, I'd love to come and cast it with him. Uh, and both it was at the time Tobias uh, from ESL and Graycon both replied the same thing. Sure, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look at you. Who are you? <laughs> and, uh, you know, why do you want to do it? And I was like, well, I, because at the time I just um, come back from living in Korea. So that really actually helped me a lot because I lived with tasteless narcosis. So I told them I just got back from Korea and I live with tasteless narcosis. Uh, and, I, and I know everyone really well. We're good friends. I've been playing a lot of StarCraft too. I think I could do pretty good. And I linked a couple of online casts that I did randomly. Uh, yeah. And they were like, uh, okay, we, you know, we can't really pay you because we don't really know what you're going to do, but we'll, I guess we'll pay for your flight and see how it goes. Uh, and that was it, really. Um, so that was my first DreamHack event. And after that, it was actually too good uh, that got me to do the rest because he knew DreamHack really, really well back then. And yeah. he knew me as well. And he, wa- he knew that I wanted to get into casting. And he suggested over to Graycon that they should look at getting me to do more than just that single event which which they did and then it just kind of uh, snowballed from there when you did that first event i mean was it like were you terrified i mean did you feel it was like a a huge pivotal moment in your career was there any extra pressure added on yourself going into that because you know it's dream Act, it's it's the big time I just looked at it like I was playing in a tournament so i i didn't really have any nerves because i just went in there and be like right it's another tournament. I'm just not playing it this time. I'm casting it. And I just casted it as if I was playing it because I was I was kind of a player back then. So yeah. I just spoke about what I would do in the game and what I wouldn't do and what I suggest towards them to do. And it wasn't really, I mean, I I was never, you know, Day9 was very big back then, but he wasn't, He mm. for me, he was just Nick's brother. Um, so he did, I didn't get hit by fame or anything like that. And yeah. I just went with it, I guess. Who was the first person within the dream hack hierarchy that sort of said, you know, you're fucking good, man. You, you can come here anytime. Like, how, how, how did you get that feedback, that approval? Um, I think it was probably midway through 2012. Uh, no, maybe not 2012, because when was it? Midway through 2011, I guess. Um, I think Graycon told me that he really, really liked my commentary and think that I could do something bigger than what I'm doing now. And I think Graycon was probably one of the first people outside of Too Good to, to really believe that I can be better than what I was. He saw something with James that, that they thought could be better and bigger. And so he, Graycon, after James pushed him into it, I suppose, mm. um, was, Graycon took it from there and he believed in everything I could do and kept on inviting me back. Do you approach the DreamHack event casting-wise? Do you approach it differently to other events? Because, as Robert's always fond of saying, because he, he does like to speak in cliches and uh, catchphrases, um, he says they're serious about not being serious. So DreamHack has a very particular style, uh, if you like. Um, do you treat a DreamHack cast differently to any other? I mean, do you get yourself into a DreamHack headspace? Um Yes and no. I mean, no in the fact that I kind of prepare and sort myself out just as much for DreamHack as I do any other event. But yes, mm-hmm. in the way that it, it's DreamHack. We're there to have fun. Um, and I also physically prepare myself for 14-hour days because that's kind of what it's like for DreamHack. That's the only difference to anything else is that mm-hmm. they work they work your ass off, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> it's really, really, really long. Um, but no, it's, it's always good. And I, I think that I'm I, I'm always more excited for DreamHack when it comes to the final stage of the tournament because the early stages it's an open tournament you you do cast a lot of lower skilled games and that's mm-hmm. kind of expected at DreamHack but as the tournament goes on you get progressively more excited and for me personally when we hit the round of eight every single time I'm so pumped to just just hit it because it's so good to to be able to you know be a part of that show. Well, everyone talks about the production values that DreamHack have um, and sort of the way that they organize the stream, the way that they do the live stage show. So let's talk about that and, and your, your opinion of it. How does it compare? Because, you know, you've been all over the world. You've, you've done all the biggest events in StarCraft 2. Um, where do you rate DreamHack? What do you think special about it? Is there anything they could do differently? 
Um, I think DreamHack's probably the... Oh, here we go. To answer your question, is DreamHack the best esports event? I'd go as far as uh, in the foreign scene and say yes. Um, the, the, I think to back that statement up, if you look at every other tournament that does StarCraft 2, I'm pretty sure that they look at DreamHack and try to do something similar and, and, and try to copy their style. And whenever someone tries to copy the style, you obviously know that they're the better, they're the better product, better, better organization. DreamHack has its flaws, though. Um, mm. You know, just like everything else, I think DreamHack excels, especially when it comes to the round of eight and the finals. They kick the production is unbelievable and i don't think they're matched by anyone right now apart from maybe ogn and gom tv mm. like koreans they get it because they've been doing it for so long in the foreign scene dreamhack's number one by far when it comes to production like that but people are catching up bsl are catching up now because they've got this wcs that they're working very hard on mm. uh when dreamhack in terms of improvements i think Maybe there's some small little things they can switch around in the show, which could make it smoother, could make it more hypey, uh, mm. which I've talked to them about. But their biggest weakness, DreamHack, is always day one and day two, um, especially at the summer and winter events, because their production isn't as good as the top eight, because they, they know they focus on the top eight, top eight only. Mm. And what happens in esports is that day one and day two of old DreamHacks have not been good, but people forget about it because the top eight was so good. Yeah, yeah. Like, that happens a lot. Uh, and so DreamHack, over the last six months or so, have been focusing very much so on improving day one and day two, such as bringing in take, uh, making in control do stupid stuff and film videos and, and just make filler content. Uh, so they realize their weaknesses, and they are starting to fill them in. Uh, do, have you ever sat there? Cause I, like, I, I, I've done this. Like, I, I, I've done casting, right? Like, you know, for, for, for Counter-Strike, Source, primarily although i've done some 1.6 events and i've done the group stages where it's like you know shit noobs versus wasda masters and yeah. you've got to try and make it sound exciting you know there's about 80 people who are really going to be into this and you might get you know another 20 people just stumbling across watching it by accident um and you know I, I, i'll be honest i'll find it hard to to do a professional cast because I'm as fucking bored as everyone watching and, and mm. probably, you know, everyone except the 10 people playing uh, would be. So have you ever sat there on the day one and the day two, you know, when you've been cast in a game and it's like just two amateurs and it's low level play? Like, you know, how do you stay sharp and, and how do you make the cast worth listening to? I think... Uh, in all honesty, this kind of style of commentary was my biggest weakness for a very, very long time because I got brought in uh, to cast high-level StarCraft from the very beginning. So bringing myself down to cast low-level, there's times where I've been with Total Biscuit and we've been at, at tournaments and we had to cast Bronze League versus Gold League. And it's not fun because that's not, for me, that's not where StarCraft is. StarCraft for me is the top level players playing the best StarCraft. That's where the art of StarCraft comes from. So a lot of the time I was actually kind of weak in those casts, like really weak as in, you know, like, what, oh God, what are we watching? Um, and that happened a lot. That's happened at DreamHack before. I, I think I've looked and had negative feedback where people like, you know, Paul, like, we get it. These guys are bad, but, you know, you've got to lighten up a little bit. And I had that quite a lot last year, I think. Um, but I, I, I looked at it and changed it and realized that it was one of my weaknesses. And mm. you, I just looked at it in a different way and said that, you know, these two guys have, have paid money to come here. They've, um, you know, they've, got, they've been brave enough to enter this tournament where we have people like, for example, Startail Life coming to this one and, you know, other, other fantastic players. And they're willing to, to put their neck on the line and play the games. Yeah. And you just got to kind of credit them. You got to be like, you know, these guys are bad at StarCraft compared to the pro players, but they're, they're giving it their best. And, you know, I, I took a different approach to it. And that's where I found the real gist of being able to cast that kind of level. Okay. And just before we go over to the Twitter sphere, prevailing dream hack memory. Like, and I, I guess I'm kind of asking you to divide this. First, what is the most memorable moment while you've been casting a game? Uh, the thing that leaps out at you, and second was the most memorable moment of what's gone on behind the scenes. Ah, all right, I've got a really bad memory. I got, I got <laughs> long-term memory loss. I'm, I'm great when it comes to short-term. Um, the most memorable game, yeah, at DreamHack. 
I'd, I'd like to go as far and say uh, the the uh, the Naniwa Jadong series when the crowd went absolutely berserk yep. uh, because he he managed to beat Jadong. Um, I think that was one of the one of the best games I've cast, but one of the best moments probably was when Thorzane won in yeah. Stockholm. Uh, I think my voice went crazy. The the crowd went crazy. Um, yeah, that's probably one of the best moments. And then you've got stupid moments, I guess, as well, which we encountered Valencia, which is you know, having fun, and Bucharest, where the famous rap video came out. I don't know if you, you've seen that video when I was rapping um, because the production went haywire. It was crazy. Um, but those, those are my moments, I guess. And, and what about the stuff uh, away from the stream? Because, you know... We, everyone just like to get together for a drink afterwards and there's a real nice party atmosphere. So is there any uh, any amusing stories you can uh, dish the dirt on while you're here? Trying to think. We've had a couple of, I think it was maybe Stockholm event after Thor's Day 1. There was an after, 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 after party at the house where, <laughs> I mean, Robert was, Robert was involved. So uh, you know how those kind of go. Um, yeah. Outside of the game... Trying to think of some memorable moments. I don't know actually, because usually at the end of the tournaments, I just die. <laughs> I was going to so say not... you looked tired at the last one, bro. I mean, you were fucking wiped. I think you had you yeah. just come back from China then as well, though. So. Yeah, yeah, some country. <laughs> yeah, some some like country. Um, I don't know. I I don't really, I don't really remember to be honest. Uh, that's all right. No, no one ever answers that question anyway. <laughs> but uh, and, and and with good reason. We all want to work in this industry for as long as possible. So uh, <laughs> best to keep those cards close to your chest. So we will go over to my lovely co-host who's been uh, rummaging around uh, the internet to find interesting questions and statements about DreamHack to put to our guest here, Apollo. James, what's been going on? What have you got for us? We've had a few questions come in. First one, very on topic. When are you going to cast World of Tanks? <laughs> all right. Um... <laughs> World of Tanks, League of Legends, Counter Strike Go. No, I'm not doing them, guys. Mm. I'm actually uh, just, just a one game guy. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, uh, that's cool. I'm, I'm dedicated to StarCraft, and what I do takes a lot of my time. And I, if I was to ever cast a different game, I would want to put the same focus that that I put into StarCraft and be able to to do two games at once with the level of effort I put in is not possible. It's one game or another. So until StarCraft 2 dies, then I'm with StarCraft 2 every, every, every time. Just for yeah. a bit of devil's advocatory, sorry, sorry James, uh, okay. but uh, what if Riot said, you know what, we've got a pretty good team, but this, uh, this Apollo guy, man, we need to turn him to the dark side. <laughs> so we're, go we're going to fucking offer him a contract like no one has ever seen. I'm talking life-changing money. I'm talking fatality money. Right, on the table for you. Do you walk away from StarCraft 2 and uh, ride that lol gravy train? So, as great as that would be, and trust me, I've probably had dreams about this, um, <laughs> as good as it would be, it would be very short term because what would end up happening is I'd make the switch and I wouldn't be as good as what they're expecting me to be because it's taken me a long time to get where I am in StarCraft. Um, so, I'd probably make a lot of money very fast. And then the, the contract will probably get pulled out really, really fast too. So I probably wouldn't make that kind of money for very long. And then I'd be like, StarCraft, can I come back? And they'd be like, you're a sellout. <laughs> um, so as, as great as it would be, as long as StarCraft's there, it doesn't matter. It, I'd always be StarCraft. It doesn't matter. Okay. I'm out, James. Tag you back in, bro. You're, you're saying you put a lot of effort into StarCraft. And it's quite obvious. You, a couple of people mentioned your YouTube channel as well on, um, in the chat. And they're asking when the next tutorial is coming up and stuff. Do you find it, have you been able to do much YouTube recently? Because obviously you've been away and there's a lot of casting. Has it been, have you been, has it been sidelined recently or I don't know? It has been sidelined. It's, it, I think my last video was like a month ago. And the reason for it was is because I, I was like, all right, time to start up my new set of tutorials and get working on my YouTube videos. And then all of a sudden, ESL like, the round of 16 is in a week's time. Get over here. So I was like, all right, there, there goes all my time, uh, and, and I focused on that. And then as soon as that finished, like I mentioned earlier, I had to go to Korea, and I'm in DreamHack. So in between tournaments, 
it's very difficult for me to produce the content, even though I could probably just smack out a video right now. I could, you know, leave this conversation, go record it and do it and put it online tonight. It wouldn't be to the quality I want it to be, especially when I'm doing tutorials. Like you have to play at a good level. Otherwise, what, what the hell is this tutorial? I can't just whack out a game and do it. So it takes a lot of preparation to know what I'm going to talk about, how good I'm going to play. So to be able to squeeze that in between tournaments is very difficult. And that also takes away time for my preparation, pre preparation on these tournaments as well. So when I get some more free time and have a couple of weeks in a row where I can sit down, play the game again, uh, and, and be able to teach it again, that's when the, the videos will always come. Do you enjoy it more, YouTube, or do you enjoy casting more? Casting, straight away, casting. Yeah. YouTube's what I do when I can't cast, because it's, it's StarCraft stuff when I can't cast. It's just, it's just more StarCraft. So it's just it's, more StarCraft. It's to fill in the gaps. I can't say no to that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so start talking more about StarCraft then, WCS, we had a couple of people ask if there was one thing you could change about WCS going into the next season, what would you change? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that the glaring thing, and if I had all the, if the company that I wanted had all the budget in the world and I could make anything happen with it, with a magic wand, the round of 32 would be played out live, is the first thing I'd change. Um, I feel that that's a necessity to have the Premier League needs to be played out live ASAP. Um, the reason why it's not is probably a budget thing. It's flying a lot of people in. That's a lot of hotels. It's a lot of money that you know ESL may or may not have. So that's the first thing I'd change. From there on out, it's ESL have done a really good job where they improve really fast over a short period of time. Um, other than that, it's probably a standalone. So first of all, it's the uh, Runner 32 Live. Then I'd like to push ESL in the direction of getting out of their studio where they can have a larger crowd and getting a standalone WCS Premier League. If not, sending the Premier League finals to different countries. Just kind of bring it to another level. You can, you can send the round of eight to any country in Europe as long as you do the production. I don't think Blizzard are going to care. And you can, you can have that touring attitude. Um, so, so those are big things um, which are you know, out of the reach and, and cost a lot of money. Um, small things is just improved production, uh, I want to help ESL in, in the future um, be able to do more. Uh, I think the things that are missing, anyone's, everyone's missing, and I want to help anybody that's willing to work with me in production is to be able to get the right player shots at the right time, which Koreans do very, very well, um, to show emotions at the right time. Um, I also want first-person shots in the game at the right time, which no one's done yet either, and also to be able to bring out personalities more and more and more of the players. I think that's what I was able to do with Day9 in, in Korea for OGN. And a lot of people love that stuff. So I, I guess that's kind of my list. That's cool. Well, maybe we'll see that in the not-so-distant future. Hopefully there'll be an so, in, in, influx of money. Come. Maybe we'll win the lottery or something. I think the lottery is quite big this weekend, isn't it? If those come, you can, you can refer back to this video and you're like, that, that little guy over there, <laughs> he said that, he said that. Um, and the last question was one which I, I didn't really get it, but he, he was persistent. He asked it every minute for the last hour. So I thought I'd ask it, <laughs> does Apollo cast his life? And I imagine he means, do, do, you, do you find yourself casting about stuff in everyday life because you're so used to casting? Do you, are you able to zone out of casting or do you find yourself just That's, uh, thinking like a caster a when you're just doing question. everyday things? It is a weird thing. but. I, does that ever happen? Like, um, do, no, do you ever? Frankly, no. not. No, no. Um, I don't find myself going. All right, now it's time to make a couple of eggs. So we're your... going to go boil them and going to put the toast on at the same time. No, um, in your head, <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. The, the thing it's is, quite dude, easy right? To switch from uh, from Castle well, we to can... just Sean, normal Sean. You can thank. <laughs> It's Istvan Porter twenty three for that question. I, I'm really <laughs> asked it because he was so persistent and he just he he really. I'll tell you who that guy is, right? Like, because <laughs> I know people oh. who've done, and I, as in, I don't know who he is, but he's the kind of guy who does this thing. I, I know guys who do this. When they're playing like football manager, they do the press conference. <laughs> they actually speak it out loud. Well, we've had a good game, lads. You know, we've worked really yeah, hard today. Yeah. You know, with the door shut, there's no one else around. And they, yeah. and they do it before clicking continue in the top right hand corner. Yeah, he's yeah, one yeah. of those guys, absolutely. So yeah, I don't know but, if those kind of guys need help. But, you know, 
I'm just saying. Well, I, I kind of used to be like that. Too. I used to play football manager. <laughs> there I, we go, there we go. The day, though. I know. I've seen, I've seen you guys do We were children back then, I suppose. So it kind of it can be forgiven. Well, if you're so, right. Some of us were. <laughs> I, was still, I was still pretty old. No well, doubt they, about they, it. So. They do say what talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. So mm -hmm. talking to a fake conference room must be like another level. Talking about... Talking about talking to yourself, I got a little story for you before we jump on to the next part. Nice story. I love stories, and you like this one too. So it was um, pretty sure it was breakfast or lunchtime, whatever it was. I was in the kitchen here, and I, and I was making my food, and I, I just looked around. I look outside, and uh, James is there, and he's he's smoking away, and he, he's he's he looks like for me he's talking to someone. So I'm like, all right, let's go have a look who's outside. What we're we talking about today? What what East, what problem we got here? So I go outside and I, and he and he stops talking and I, and I peer around around the corner. I'm like, there's there's no one here. <laughs> and I look at like, James, we were you just speaking to someone? He goes, oh no, I was just just I had this daydream. And I was just playing it out in my head and he was verbally speaking. And I thought, what the hell is going on with him? So talk about madness. Yeah, well, I, I've, worried, I've worried about James for a while, actually. You know, he's starting to get a little bit, you know, like a bit more twitchy. And I think I think the stress is starting to tell, man. The good studios really, really took its toll on him. He's 30 years old now, isn't he? So Yeah, well, that, that's the thing, dude. I mean, you know, he's still not as old as me. He's catching me up, though. But, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's definitely one of the, the veterans uh now so, James. yeah it, it's it's good to know he's a nutter that's thanks thanks for sharing that himself on outside <laughs> yeah I, to be honest I, I i'm gonna put myself in that group as well because i know when i walk to the train station i find myself thinking things and i'm saying them out loud and then i realize i'm doing it i'm like of course stop too, that's, I need to, I need that's to go when to you sleep. start doing that and pretend you've got your phone earpiece in like you know cause... yeah when i walk yeah. past people they give yeah. me funny looks and i'm like oh shit i'm talking to myself there we go so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, haven't, I don't talk to myself. I'm, I keep it all in. <laughs> right, well, <before laughs> Maybe that's a bad thing. That you need to let it out sometimes. Before this turns into some sort of weird self-help group, uh, <laughs> uh, James, uh, I, I will come back to you before the end of the show, I promise. Uh, keep rummaging around. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting for someone to definitively answer the question. Um, send, it's, your, it's, send your answers in, everyone. Yeah, it's good that Sean's Sean's had a bash. Guests don't often do the question, so uh, I'm happy about that. Right, so we talked a bit about WCS, and one of the things that's been talked about a lot is, um, you know, DreamHack not getting it, the whole ESL doing a good job, but what would DreamHack have done, all these question marks. Um, and for me, I don't know, it, it, it seems a smart decision and a weird decision at the same time. So as kind of a... a, a almost an outsider. Uh, what did you think when you heard it was going to be an ESL thing and not a DreamHack thing? Well, I'm not tied to anyone and I got three words. Um, it actually, um, because I was working with DreamHack at the time and I lived in Sweden, it was a no-brainer that I wasn't happy because I live here and it would have been very easy for me to just drive 40 minutes, half an hour and do WCS and have a hands-on approach uh, me and Adam BC, uh, you know, uh, could tag team this and mm -hmm. work with DreamHack very well. And I think that we could have had something very special. Mm -hmm. um, so at the point of the announcement, I was like, oh, God, like, oh, no, this is not good at all. Um, but then my attitude changed very fast around it when we started to see ESL improve because I was very scared about it. I think that's what everyone was really – I think that's what all the, the – the question mark surrounding the DreamHack ESL thing was because if you look at their history and what their tournaments have done, you look at WCS EU last year and you look at all the amazing DreamHack winters we've had and you know if that team had the WCS product, everyone was like, all right, it has to be good. And then if you look at the IM events that have been in New York and uh, Comic Con and, and these Chinese ones that hadn't been run so well, and mm -hmm. IEM just had this a lot of negativity around them because of the prize money scandal thing as well. So yeah. a lot of people just put those two images together and were like, "It's obvious that DreamHack should have got it, guys." Like, and then I think my attitude and everybody else's attitude changed too because there's no there's no hate now. You don't see those posts anymore. Like, I still wish DreamHack had this <laughs> contract. You don't yeah. have that anymore because ESL. 
knuckled down. Um, you know, they, they, they made a new studio. They, they got things ready. They improved a lot. And uh, looking at the, I actually having been in Germany in, in Cologne with the ESL guys in their office, the effort that goes into WCS is amazing. People mm. working a lot of hours for, for many days in a row. And the, the, I was very happy when I first started talking to them about it. I was like, all right, well, who's in charge for WCS? And Carmack, like, me. And I was like, okay, that's really good because I like what you do. Uh, and Carmack was in charge of it. Carmack put a lot of effort into it. Red Eye was behind a lot of the background things as well. And so the combination of Red Eye and, and Carmack and the production team listening to what they wanted to show and then now Kennegut coming in as well. Mm. They've, they've done a very, very good job with the limited resources they had at the time and just overall being, being shoved into a product two weeks before going live is obviously very, very difficult. So when it comes to my opinion initially, definitely was like, should have been DreamHack. But now I'm like, I'm happy it's there. They're doing, they're doing fine with it. What have you made of WCS as a whole? Uh, we've talked if there was one thing you could change, so kind of covered the topic a little bit. But uh, I'm uh, to put forward my own perspective. I've actually found it. I, I don't know what the word is. Maybe a little jumbled. If you're following me, I, it's kind of been. It's felt rushed. I think the whole kind of concept yeah. and, and and execution. And in terms of keeping abreast of everything and up to date with everything, it hasn't felt as as vibrant or as compelling as say LCS in League of Legends, where it's you know you can just go on a weekend. You you know you've got three days of solid games. You go to the dedicated website. You've got an excellent stream, excellent cast. There's excellent production value, uh, and it's you know one one week it's one region, the next week it's another region. It hasn't felt as well executed. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are because you know. You must be. I mean, if if it's not perfect, it must pain you. I guess loving StarCraft Two as much as you do. Yeah, that's one of the biggest, you know, problems with with uh, being a commentator and working for companies is that behind all this, I'm a, I'm a fanatic for the game, so it, it is difficult to balance that. Um, for me, when it when it comes down to scheduling uh, and how WCS pans out, I watch pretty much all and as much as I can. And it, and it it seems to be okay for me when it comes to when the games are on and what to expect because. Mm. I wake up every morning at 10 a.m. GSL is on, and I watch WCS. Then, yeah, you know, I play in the afternoon, and then at six o'clock, WCS EU is on, and then at 12 o'clock, WCS NA is on. Even though it's all in one day, it's a repeated thing that four, happens yeah. four times a week. So, uh, and that's like Tuesday to Friday, basically, was the WCS schedule last season that led up to eventually a weekend where the playoffs happened. So, yeah. in, in terms of that, that was that was good. When it when when it comes to as you say. Um, having great production, great resources, uh, casters and players and production. I think that obviously LCS has got a lot of money thrown into it, which makes things a lot easier. I think anything's easy when you've got a lot of money. Um, and I don't think the same for WCS. They don't have the same resources that LCS has. And also LCS is, is now into it a lot more. They, they've got their stride going. And I reckon if we look at season two and then again season three for WCS across all regions, it will be a lot better and a lot smoother and hopefully will eliminate a lot of your concerns. Mm. How do you feel about the ranking system in general? Um, WCS, um, it's difficult to, to give a proper answer because I haven't seen it play out at the moment. I feel the biggest problem with the, the point system is that there's too many European opportunities to gain points mm. compared to America and Definitely Korea, uh, yeah. because you've got DreamHack, IM events. I guess IM will, will technically be global as well, but still difficult to get to for Koreans and maybe some Americans if they go South America and China again, like they have done previously. Mm. Uh, but for Europeans, there's you know Home Story Cup's been announced as a tier two, and that's not a tournament that many Americans and Koreans can get to. DreamHack tour is all in Europe, um, so I think that the biggest flaw of the WCS point system is that it's not equal for all three regions which are meant to try to claim to the same points throughout the end of the year to go to BlizzCon is that Europe has many, many more options to actually get more points. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be make it a little bit imbalanced as the year goes on. Anything that we can do to address that, do you think? Ah. Wave your magic wand, Sean. Come on, ah. fix, fix it for me. Um, there are Korean tournaments that are happening that we don't even know about which could 
you know, come up with WCS points, but then you've got to look at the format and make sure it's an open tournament too. And then you've got to push Europeans and Americans to go to those regions. Um, I don't know. I, I, my magic wand's out of power. I, I don't know. If, if, I, if I did know, maybe I'd be making a lot more money working at Blizzard at the higher ends. But, do, uh, uh, do Blizzard listen to you? I mean, do you feel like you have a direct line? Because, you know, you're an important personality. I know for a fact that, you know, when it comes to certain things, uh, p prominent personalities like Day9, you know, they get to have their input. They get to, their, their, their uh, input is valued. Um, are you at that stage? Do you get to talk to these people? Um, <clears throat> before WCS was announced and as it begun in season one, I had zero input to WCS at all. Um, um, last WCS Europe, I had a lot more, um, mm. speaking with Mark Alberts a lot and, and being back and forth with him because it was his thing back then. Um, so I had a lot with him. Um, now that the seasons are starting to kick off and the right people are in control of WCS at the moment, I'm having more input. Like I'm, They asked me to write reports. I can write reports on what I thought about. Because I was in Europe and Korea, so I can write reports. The The biggest influence I'd say I have, um, oh, well, with Blizzard, not over Blizzard, but with Blizzard, I guess would be probably David Kim, who asked me a lot about the game. Mm. Um, WCS, not as much, but I guess my opinion now um, rather than earlier, it is more listened to. But I think back then, Blizzard were... I don't think they cared about people's opinions, actually. The higher ends of Blizzard back then, when WCS was getting announced and released, they didn't care. They just wanted it to be out as fast as possible. Probably skipped lines in the Blizzard chain of command yeah. just to get this out there as fast as possible. But now things have settled down. I think it's uh, a little bit easier for everyone. Okay, and just to get back, cause we're dragging it back to DreamHack just before we go over to James for one last time. Uh, I need to ask you your predictions. Um, and it doesn't need to just be how you see the tournament going, who's going to win, all of that bullshit. Um, let's say top three things that will definitely happen at DreamHack, according to Apollo. Uh, top three things that are going to happen at DreamHack. Um, life is going to go to the finals. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Uh, number two is another player is probably going to drop out. <laughs> no, <I don't>. um, <laughs> number two, I'm hoping and expecting Naniwa to make it to the round of eight as one of the, if not the only Swedish player again in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And number three is that you're going to enjoy yourself. <laughs> There's my three. <laughs> I'm not having that. Again, a real three. A real three. Come oh, on. what? Uh, okay. So, <laughs> life's going to get to the finals. Yeah. Naniwa's going to make it to the round of eight. Yeah. And... Well, just say the question again. What's going to happen, right? Three yeah. things are going to happen. It can be anything. Just I'm going to cast 14 hours in one day. <laughs> there we go. Right, okay. <laughs> that, that's the answer. I'll cast... Actually, day one, I've had the schedule in my email. Yeah. Day one is going to be the longest day of StarCraft 2 that I have ever worked on. Ever worked on. It's going to be long. How, how are you? You got any special plans for preparation? Uh, not in terms of content wise, but in you know, physicality wise. I don't think people realize just how draining casting is. Actually, um, I've been doing a lot of things uh, over the last six months, or at least attempting to do a lot of things to, to, to try and help that out. Um, before, what ended up happening uh, like a year ago is I'd probably drink a lot of energy drinks, and, and it would be like this throughout the day, yeah, yeah. like up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, but, what I, but what I've been trying to do, which I've been not doing as well in recently, which I'll definitely try to do again, is cut energy drinks out of my life completely, including coffee. Uh, it is one of the things to have a 100% stable day and an equal day uh, to be able to drink lots of water and replenishment and also to be physically fit I think actually helps players and casters to be able to cast that long uh, because if you're not then you're going to drain your energy super fast than you would do usually and those are the, the, the key things I think. I, I struggle just sitting here for two hours. Uh, right, this is the very last question then, James, then I will let you go. Uh, right, I totally forgot about this, and it was one of the things that I had at the forefront of my thinking at the start of the show. The community casters, DreamHack, uh, bringing in um, you know, guys that certainly 
don't have the same presence as you, but you know, a bit further down the trough, so to speak. But they're going to get a chance to obviously uh, do some commentary. Uh, Nathanius is, is in particular the guy I'm thinking of. So, uh, are, are you going to be t- putting an arm around him, taking him under the Apollo wing? All right. So the the true story, he sports honesty right now. Um, true story uh, with Nathanius and the way that Nathanius came into DreamHack, um, and a lot of people still wonder why that he's the guy casting is because at the last DreamHack tournament I cast with Autosis and I don't think you can pair me and me and Autosis without Autosis to anyone and expect the same level of quality. Mm. So I came up with this and and you know I'm pretty sure I mean Adabisi may throw something at me but this is my idea. Um, is that I thought that DreamHack listened to me too. They're really good. They, I'm happy they listened to me with this. Um, I thought that if we try to bring in somebody like DJ Wheat, Cat's Pajamas, Kevin Nock, anyone that's kind of a caster but not the same level as Autosis, the community would be like, yeah, it's not Autosis. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's not Autosis. But then what I said, then what we should do then, because that's going to happen no matter what we do if we yeah. try to get any mid-tier commentator, Let's just go to the complete opposite scale to Autosis. And let's go to somebody that hasn't cast an event. Uh, so you've got the most popular caster in the world, arguably, you know, Autosis. And then you've got this unknown guy that's never cast a live event before. So go to the other spectrum and pick this guy up. And then you won't get these mid-tier. Yeah, he's not as good as Autosis. And then what really helps push this in the right direction as well is that the DreamHack brand and the way that they push themselves out there is the DreamHack Open. Uh, the the hype video they made last tournament was anybody's a winner. It's an opportunity tournament. So having Nathanius come in in, in this opportunistic way mm. fits DreamHack. It's where I started, you know, having my first set of tournaments. It's where people uh, like Graycon mentioned earlier, where Mana played a qualifier, went to the finals. It's where people have made their names at DreamHack. So having Nathanius come in as his first tournament is is. Probably the best option, if, if you had a list of every single caster from Famous to YouTube, Nathanius was perfect for, for, to cast with me for yeah. DreamHack Summer. Uh, and that was the decision behind uh, him coming. And yes, I'm going to have my arms around him. I know it's his first tournament. It's his first time outside of America too, yeah. uh, which is going to be pretty big for him. And he might get hit by jet lag and so on. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're going to have fun. We're going to work together and we're going to kick ass. Do you, do you rate him? Have you, have you listened to his stuff? Yeah, I have actually. He, I'm going to go with the rest of the audience. He does sound a little bit like Mr. Bitter. Um, but yeah, I, I, I noticed his cast. He's, the thing is what, uh, you know, we could, we, me, and, me and you, Richard, we can just keep drinking. Even though we're not <laughs> drinking, we could start drinking and talk about esports for a long time now. I'm not tired like That's at cool. events. Um, when it comes to StarCraft 2 commentary right now, and I really do like to put myself uh, of a frontier for it all because it's something mm. I'm very passionate about is I feel that a lot of the direction for casting right now is away from true StarCraft commentators. Um, you know, I don't want to throw under MLG, uh, MLG under the bus, but their talent that goes to cast events, I don't look at as StarCraft 2 commentators. I look at them as YouTube personalities with a lot of Twitter followers that come in and enjoy casting StarCraft. But it's not, they're not commentators. And it's yeah. one of the, I mean, Adabisi told me this too, and he fully agrees, is that, one of the re- main reasons why, as you pointed out, LCS is well run with good commentators, good production, is because they're commentators. They cast every single day, like all week. They go to a different region, they cast all week. Nathanius fits that role. He is a StarCraft 2 commentator, is very passionate about the game and loves the game. And that's like me. So mm. if he has the opportunity to express that and can show that passion uh, and not get nervous and do a good job, then that, like he's the kind of person that we need to improve ourselves uh, uh, to broadcast at a new level. And hopefully that's what, you know, maybe we can start something there. Well, I, I love the guy because he always, he's always in the chat on the other show we do, the climbing the ladder. He's always just sat in there, like, just spamming it all the time. Like, that's where I knew him from. I didn't even know. Like, when people said, oh, that Nathanius is going to be doing it, I thought it was a fucking joke because I just knew him as, <laughs> serious, I, I, I just knew him as the, the Twitch yeah. TV, TV chat nerd. Like, I thought he was just a, a regular, and then I was like, yeah, yeah, he's going to be there. It wasn't a bait. So, uh, so I hope he does well. I'm looking forward to meeting him. I'm going to do an interview with him. That's uh, one of the plans Sorry. I've got. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely break him in real nice, I think, me and you. It'll be good. Yeah. 
on the last <laughs> night we'll get him a little bit tipsy it was, yeah, i want to see if these americans really can drink yeah i was gonna say i just want to see if how americans drink because they've <laughs> all got frat boy syndrome I every american actually, i've ever drank with actually uh, i'll let i think he's not even 21 so i think his drink experience may be a Fucking little bit limited brilliant that that is that is perfect that wait, is wait. Taylor, mate. he's 20 years old there you go he's 20 so is is his legal drinking's been limited, which means he hasn't drunk that much before. So, welcome to Sweet Robert. You wait till you meet Robert and Nathanius. There we go. I'm telling you, know, you we're going to sleep about him. Now I feel like this poor guy's going to die of alcohol poisoning, and this vod's going to be used as evidence. Yeah, I, I know. I, I just pictured this being disgusting caught, and then yeah. you know 